Hello everyone, MR Tech here. Welcome to the first video on this channel. Today we will tackle one of the most interesting topics in computer science, the unsolved mystery of P versus NP. Ever since I first heard about this problem in my freshman year of college, I was astounded by the thought of it. In fact, this is a very simple yes or no question, but if the answer turns out to be yes, the world would be completely turned upside down. And when I say that, I don't mean that in a way your local salesman says your world will change if you buy this vacuum cleaner. I literally mean the whole world would be a different place. And if you were to find a way to prove it, you'd be awarded one million dollars. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's first define the terminology we need, then dig into the details. Before we begin, make sure to smash that subscribe button for more videos like this. And of course, hit that thumbs up button if you like this video to support me further. Without further ado, let's get to it. You probably heard the word algorithm a million times, but what is it exactly? Is it a magic word that makes stuff work? Well, pretty much so. I will assume that you have some intuitive understanding of what the word problem means. Basically something that requires a solution, right? Well, an algorithm is nothing else but a strategy to solve some problem. Let's propose one problem and try to solve it and see how this works in an example. Suppose your mom sends you to a Walmart and asks you to buy the cheapest noodles that they have there. Let's call this problem the noodle problem. We go to the store and now we can consider two possible strategies to solve this problem and to come home and make our mom happy. First strategy would be to pull out all the noodles they have in the store, put them on table and sort them by price and then just take the first noodle in this list. Hopefully you do realize that this is a bit of an overkill, but hey, it is still a valid strategy or we could say a correct algorithm. Let's proceed to the second strategy. We can simply go through the noodles and always remember what is the cheapest package of noodles we have seen so far. And we, when we reach the end, just go back to this one. This is a much simpler way and more efficient, but it is a still a completely valid strategy to solve the same problem. Let's talk about problem reduction now. To understand what it means to reduce a problem, let's play this game. It's a simple two-player game. We are given a set of numbers 0, 1 and 2. Each player selects one number from that list. The goal is to select higher number than your opponent. There is a catch, however, you can't just keep selecting 2 and always win. If you select 2 and your opponent selects 0, he wins, no matter what. If you select the same number, you just repeat the game. Well, this game probably seems boring at the moment, but let me ask you this. Does it sound familiar? Hmm. How about if we change the names of our numbers? Let's call 0 rock, 1 shall be paper, and 2 will be scissors. You can notice that this game is completely the same as rock, paper, scissors. And this renaming of our numbers is called reduction of the problem. So basically we reduce our game to rock, paper, scissors, and in this case, since they are the same, we can do the opposite process and reduce rock, paper, scissors to this game we talked about. But what's the point of just renaming stuff? Well. Making sense of it is really simple. It goes as follows. If we can reduce one problem to another, and we know how to solve the initial problem, the new problem is also solved in a way. For example, if we wanted to find an optimal strategy to rock, paper, scissors, and we wanted to use computer, it would probably be nicer to enter 0, 1 and 2 in computer, and if we found the strategy to play this 0, 1, 2 game optimally, we could easily just translate it to our rock, paper, scissors strategy. Okay, now that we have a general idea of what it means to reduce a problem, let's move on. It is probably intuitive to you that not all the problems are equally complex. For example, finding the cheapest noodle in a store and playing a perfect game of chess are intuitively the problems of a very different difficulty and should be treated as such. But what does it exactly mean that two problems are not equally difficult? Well, all the problems that exist in the world, from playing chess to finding the cheapest noodles to finding a sequence of flights from New York City to Moscow to cracking bank codes, can all be broken down into some general classes of complexity. 
Of course, there are more classes, but for the sake of this video, we will only consider the three classes shown in this diagram. P, NP, and MP complete. Essentially, uh, P represents all those problems that are easy to solve, like for example, finding the cheapest noodle. NP is the class of those problems that may or may not be easy to solve, but once solved, they are easy to check, like finding a sequence from a flights from New York to Moscow. You see, to find one such sequence, you'd have to check all the flights from New York to all cities in the world, and then from each of those cities to every other, until you reach Moscow at some point. Now, I'm not saying that this is a hard problem from a, for a computer, but we definitely agree that if someone gives you this sequence, New York, Tokyo, Moscow, you'd be like, yep, this goes from New York to Moscow, so checking the solution is really, really simple. Finally, MP complete are the hardest problems in MP class. They are really nice because every problem in MP can be reduced to every problem in MP complete easily. That is in polynomial time, which is really important, but we will get to what it means. Let's first informally see what easy means. We say the problem is easy if increasing the size of the input by little doesn't significantly increase the time required to solve a problem. For example, if we have two or five noodles in a store, checking their prices and picking the lowest doesn't take significantly different times. The same goes for if we have, for example, 15 or 20 noodles in a store. On the other hand, we say a problem is hard if a small change in the input size increases the time required to solve the problem significantly. We will best understand this if we look at the example. Take a look at this cute little Sudoku. If I asked you to solve it for 10 bucks, I bet it wouldn't be a problem whatsoever. Perhaps a minute or two of your time and that's it. You could go for a beer or ice cream or whatever keeps you running afterwards. Now consider this awful thing right here. What if I asked you to solve this for 10 bucks? Yeah, you'd probably tell me to go duck myself and yeah, that's the correct answer. This thing would really take a long, long time to solve. But if the size of each block is an input, the difference in input size from the left to the right is only the difference of 2 to 5. Now, let's look at the actual solution of this bad boy on the right. Now, if someone offered you 10 bucks to check this solution, it might be worth your time. All you'd have to do is check each row, each column, and each block once, and just see if all numbers, or in this case letters, are there. Easy money, right? Indeed, Sudoku is an example of an MP problem. In fact, it is among the hardest MP problems, if you remember the term MP complete. But we will return to that in a minute. Let's first formally define the terms easy and hard problems. We say a problem is easy if there exists an algorithm that solves it in polynomial time, which we will explain what it means in a second. On the other hand, a problem is hard if the best known algorithm solves the problem in exponential time. Now let's explain what those words actually mean. A polynomial is any mathematical expression that has a variable in a basis and constant in an exponent, for example n squared. Now to fully define a polynomial we must add one more condition. That is, sum of two polynomials is still a polynomial. So for example, n to the 7th plus 3n squared is a polynomial, since n squared is a polynomial, n squared plus n squared plus n squared is still a polynomial, and n to the 7th is polynomial, and if we sum all that, we just get a polynomial. Exponential is a mathematical expression where the variable is in the exponent, for example, 2 to the power of n. Hence, uh, we say that an algorithm runs in poly time, if the number of operations required to produce the result is some polynomial of the input size. For example, if we have n noodles, we approximately need n operations, that is, n comparisons to find the cheapest noodle. For the exponential time algorithms, we can't actually find a polynomial describing the number of operations even closely, provided the size of the input can grow pretty much indefinitely. All this talk and the uh, throwing around some fancy terms, blah blah blah, but what is the big deal here? What is it that makes this one of the greatest unsolved mysteries? Let's run some experiment. 
we will assume we have a really fast computer that can do 1 billion operations per second. Suppose we have one easy problem solved with algorithm A1, which needs n cube operations to solve, and one hard problem solved by algorithm A2 needing 2 to the n operations. Well, if we have n equals 50, with A1 we need less than a second to finish. How long do you think A2 needs? 10 seconds, 15 seconds? Well, in fact, we will need to wait over 13 days to finish. Imagine if noodle problem was among those hard problems and your mom had to wait 13 days for you to come f home from the Walmart. You think that's crazy? Check this out. If we raise n to just 60, we still need under a second for A1, and A2 needs over 35 years to finish. But wait, that's not it. If n is equal to 100, A1 still needs less than a second to complete, whereas A2 needs over 40 trillion years. So this would take longer than the universe has existed or will ever exist, probably. So the big deal is that the whole world expects the hard problems to be, well, hard. We now consider, uh, for example, password cracking to be a hard problem. And whenever technology catches up and makes a faster computer, we just slightly increase the size of our passwords and we still win. But suppose if that problem turned out to be easy, that is, soluble in polynomial time, so some dude from Silicon Valley would, could just write some piece of code and get all of our bank's data and everything. On the other hand, if indeed p equals np, it would have many enormous advantages, as many problems that we now struggle with would be solved really easily and really fast, such as protein unfolding, for example, which would undoubtedly bring many advantages in biotechnology and some believe even help cure cancer. Let's finally get to the title of this video, that is, how do you earn one million dollars with this? Well, the year was 2000. There was some gathering of some really important people of science who then proposed seven extremely difficult, yet unsolved problems, and put one million dollar prize on each. These problems are called millennium problems, and so far, the year is 2021, so in 21 years, only one of those problems has ever been solved, and more on that in some other video. And yes, you guessed it, P versus NP problem is one of those seven, and no, it has not been solved yet. So in order to win one million dollars, you have to prove one of the following assertions. Either P is equal to NP, or P is not equal to NP. But before you rush into it, I must tell you that it is not as easy as finding the cheapest noodle. In fact, thousands of mathematicians and computer scientists all over the world have tried and failed to answer these questions. So is really P equal to NP? Well, no one really knows, and it seems it will take a while until we figure it out. However, many important people believe that the, in fact they are not equal, since that would be too ambitious in their opinion, whatever that means. Personally, I would like to believe that they are, and in particular I like to imagine what the world would be like and what consequences would that bring. Just imagine being able to solve almost all important problems in the world really fast. Finally, let's discuss how playing Sudoku can make you rich. First, we will make a few observations. As we mentioned some time ago, any MP problem can be reduced to any MP complete problem in poly time. Also, if a problem is easy to solve, it is certainly easy to verify the solution. Hence, every problem in P is also in NP. Since the sum of two polynomials is a polynomial by definition, combining those observations above, we can conclude that if we could solve w at least one MP complete problem in poly time, we could reduce any other MP problem to that in poly time, and then just solve this MP complete problem in poly time. Hence, every NP problem is P problem, since also every P problem is in NP, we could conclude that P is equal to NP. Okay, I threw around many turns and I know this sounds a bit confusing, but let's wrap it up. If at least one MP complete problem could be solved in polynomial time, we would be done since definitely P would be equal to MP in that case. To end this video, there is a little strategy on how to become rich by playing Sudoku really, really well. 
Thank you for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button for more videos like this one. If you liked it, please hit the thumbs up. It would really mean a lot to me. Stay safe and see you next time.